everyone! Tonight's video is on the angiosperm, which are the flowering plants. These are the most highly evolved land plants we have. Now, if you think about it, going back to our gymnosperm, which were the ones, the plants that were the first to evolve pollen that could be moved from the male, which was the male gamete, and could find the female gamete by blowing in the wind. But unfortunately, wind isn't specific. And so in order to produce enough pollen to be sure that at least one grain of pollen landed on a female gamete, gymnosperm have to produce a tremendous amount of pollen, which not only wastes energy for the trees, but it causes a lot of allergy problems for us. Do you think it's energetically efficient for a plant to make enough pollen to cover every possible surface in the hope that one pollen grain will find one seed or one male female gamete? Could pollen be transferred to the seed more efficiently? And that's where the angiosperm come in, the flowering plants. Flowers are actually an adaptation by plants to entice animals to move pollen directly from the male part to the female part. So flowers have both male and female parts. Let's look at a schematic drawing of a flower. So if we cut a flower in half, and if we'd been in the classroom, this is what we would do. You can see that they has both male and female parts. I've highlighted the male plants parts in blue and the female parts in pink. So the male parts here are the filament and the anther. And the anther is what has those pollen grains. If you look at the photograph of an actual flower, you can see the anther here and it has this yellow powdery pollen. If you ever touched a flower and accidentally touched the anther, you would get this pollen on your fingers and it would be kind of a bright yellow or orange and it's hard to remove. You have to use a lot of soap and warm water to get it off. The female parts of the flower here are the stigma, the style, and the ovary. The ovary is where the female gametes are held and the stigma and style are kind of a passageway. And what you want that had to happen is for the pollen to go from the anther to the stigma and it'll move down the style and come down here and fertilize the ovary. So to attract animals, what flowers have is, first of all, they're very brightly colored. Brightly col bright colors attract pollinators. They also have a very pretty scent. This attracts pollinators. And finally, they have a sugary liquid called nectar that's just yummy to a lot of organisms, and they will be attracted by the combination of the scent and the color and the no knowledge that there's going to be nectar there. And one of the main pollinators we have is the bee. And so the bee is attracted to the bright colors. And in fact, if you're allergic to bee stings, doctors will tell you don't wear bright colors because that's more attractive to bees. So the bee comes for the bright colors and the scent, and then it's trying to get the nectar. And when it's crawling all over the plant, it gets pollen grains attached to it. It's not trying to get pollen grains. This just happens while it's looking around trying to find the nectar. And what happens is the pollen grains can get moved from the male parts to the female part of the same flower and come down and fertilize in the ovule. Or this bee could fly to another flower and while it's crawling around trying to get more nectar, that pollen will go down to the tube of the style of this female part of a new plant and then you can get a cross fertilization. So what animals are pollinators? Well, we've already talked about the bee, but butterflies are also excellent pollinators and bats are also known to pollinate a lot of plants. What's an advantage to using pollinators? Well, first of all, you get direct pollen transfer from the male to the female part of the flower. This is a huge energy saver for the plant. What's a disadvantage to this? Well, what if the pollinator population decreases? Anytime you're relying on another population or another species to do part of the process that's critical for your life, if something happens to that population, it affects your, your life cycle. And in fact, we're seeing this today. We have a huge decrease in the bumblebee population, and there's been some trouble getting some crops fertilized. So we depend on bees to fertilize or pollinate much of our agriculture in the United States. So a drop in the bumblebee population is a huge problem for our agriculture industry. 
Some angiosperm actually surround their seeds in a fruit, and these are called the fruiting plants. So not all angiosperm produce fruits, but some of them do. What's the function of a fruit? Well, let's look at a peach, for example. The fruit entices an animal to eat the seed, and then the animal would, would eat not just the peach, but the seed, and the seed would go through the digestive tract and be released in poop, presumably far away from the original mother plant. So this is a dispersal mechanism. It gets the seed moved away from where it first fell to the ground. This serves two purposes. It can colonize more land this way. This way you're getting the dispersal of seeds far away so you can start another grove of peach trees. It also helps limit the competition for resources right near the mother plant. So the mother plant that originally made this peach with the seed needs light and it needs water and it doesn't need competition from a seed growing into a new tree right next to it. This fruit has sugar that entices the animal to eat it. This is not the energy source for the seed. The seed, which is right here, is surrounded by a seed coat and inside of that there is the endosperm and that is the energy source for the growing plant until it reaches large enough to be above ground and perform photosynthesis. So the sugar in the fruit is what entices, entices the animal to eat it. It's very important that you realize that this is not the energy source. So what's the relationship between a flower and a fruit? Well, I have two diagrams here for you. So first of all, here is a mature flower. And then this is a diagram of an apple. I've placed this upside down to how you normally see an apple. If you placed an apple on the table, this would be the bottom of the apple and this would be the stem. So let's look over here at our mature flower. We have the male parts that have the anther that has the pollen. And then we have the stigma and the style and the ovary, which has the seeds, which is the female gamete. So the pollen would come through here, go down the stigma and the style and fertilize the female gamete. And then you would get the formation of your seed. This then causes the ovary to swell as the seed is growing. And then when this ovary swells, that is what becomes our apple. So these seeds in the apple are originally what was in the ovary of the flower. If we look over here at a tomato plant, you can see that this is a tomato flower that's just starting to dry out. This was what were the petals of the flower. Here, the ovary is already starting to swell. This is the tomato starting to form. The fruit is forming from the ovary of that original flower. This part here on a further developed tomato, this really dried up little bit, was the original flower on this tomato plant. These are pictures from my backyard where I have a lot of fruit trees. If you look at a grapefruit, here is the grapefruit flower and there is the ovary just starting to swell to form the new grapefruit. And here's the stigma and the style from the original flower that the pollen came down to fertilize the female grapefruit. If you look at the pear, here you can see the dried remains of the original petals of the flower, and this is the swollen ovary. Look, it's already taking the shape of a pear. Here's one of my apple trees. Again, you can see the dried remains of the flower, the swelling ovary, and that's going to become the apple. Over here is a tangerine tree. You can still see the petals of the flower. This is again the stigma and the style. And then here's my lemon tree. You can again see the remains of the flower and you can see the swollen ovary and it's already yellow because it's a lemon tree. So that's all for tonight. Thank you very much.